Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Thanks again for joining me here at the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 38. Well, it may have taken a while, but the BMW Championship did finish, I I think. And yeah, Keegan Bradley picked up his first win in about six years. You know, it's hard to root against guys like Keegan and Webb Simpson. These guys became major champions. And then the USGA told them that they had to find another way to putt so they could continue, you know, working for a living. I'm not sure why anchoring was something that had to be banished immediately from the game of golf. But, uh, you know, that's another episode entirely. But all the best to Keegan. The rest of the guys heading to East Lake and the Tour Championship, and yes, our new number one, Justin Rose. My weekend, well, special shout out to a couple baseball legends that I actually got to play some golf with. I got paired with LeVon Hernandez and his brother Orlando. You may know Orlando by another name, El Duque. Super cool guys to play golf and hang out with. They told some great baseball stories, some golf stories as well, and, and you know, you never know. You might be hearing some more from them down the road. 3,000 strikeouts between them, five World Series rings, and still very cool, very humble. There's a pretty cool picture that we took after the round. You know where you can find that photo, don't you? You can find a lot of stuff over on Instagram. Yes, we are on Instagram. We're there at the Back of the Range podcast. Don't forget, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. We have lots of new fun golf swag to give away just to kind of get the name out there we have towels hats beer koozies all with our logo on them we're just getting rid of them leave a review in apple podcast hit me up with a message of encouragement or tell me you're bored and you have a suggestion really let me know what you think of the podcast and don't forget we have a little thing called free towel tuesdays where you know you leave a couple comments on instagram we pick a couple winners and we get these towels flying out of here get them in your hands That way you can take them, use them on the course. So this week's guest is Michael Cartrude. I've known Michael for a few years while I've watched him play golf around Palm Beach County as an amateur. He has since turned professional. And while he has played on the mini tours around Florida and all around the country, he's now competing on a regular basis on the McKenzie Tour. Yes, Canada. He told me some funny stories about some of his rookie mistakes getting around on tour. Put it this way, playing golf might not be his biggest obstacle. You'll see what I mean when you listen to the episode. Now, you know these mini tour guys need to find some extra source of income here and there. So, Michael found a job at a golf course around town. A lot of pros do it, you know, just to help out in the bag room, pick up some tips, you know, clean the range, stuff like that. No big deal. Everyone's done it. Um, Except one thing about his job made it a little bit unique. He worked at the Bears Club. Yep, Jack's place. I'm sorry, Mr. Nicholas's place. Let's see, who hangs out there? Rory, DJ, Jason Day, Luke Donald, Michael Bleeping Jordan. Yep, they all hang around at the Bears Club, and when the tour guys aren't on tour, they have to have a place to practice. And Michael had a few stories to share about his time at the Bears Club. Michael even told the story about how we met at the 2008 Florida State Amateur. It's an embarrassing story for him, but more importantly, it's embarrassing for me as well. So I let him pick on me a bit. I didn't even edit the story out. So, you know, extra points for me. One more thing. I do it all the time, but I really do appreciate everyone supporting the back of the range. If you're enjoying it, let me know. If you're not, let me know that too. But keep spreading the word. Share it on Facebook and Twitter. I know it takes a little bit of time out of your day, but it would mean the world. So please go ahead and do so. So let's get started with this week's episode. Mr. Cartrude, I appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me here at the back of the range. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. So we've known each other for quite a long time growing up in South Florida. Um, I have been the uh, older mid-am hack. You've been the uh, younger uh, uh, stalwarts in Palm Beach County uh, playing uh, uh, exceptional golf throughout your uh, uh, amateur career, now your professional career. As we typically do on this episode, we on these episodes, we like to uh, give the listeners a little bit of background on our guest. So if you can just kind of give us a brief synopsis of how you got into the game of golf uh yeah so i uh played a lot of baseball growing up and really hadn't i wanted to play baseball and then my dad kind of got me into it about eighth ninth grade and took me to hit some range balls and uh just started going from there and really it was just as like a hobby and uh 
my baseball coach came up to me one day and said, Hey, you got a chance at some kind of a scholarship if you really go hard into baseball. And, uh, I, he said, but I had to quit golf. And I said, absolutely not, not going to happen. And, <laughs> nice. uh, that was the best decision he ever made for me. <laughs> so I ended up quitting baseball and play golf. And I said, well, I'm not very good at golf, so I better get good fast. So, so wait a minute. So you had no, so he, he saw a potential in you in baseball and then you just, you just love golf that much that you're like, well, um, yeah, you just, I'm just going to just figure out a way to get better. I, I wasn't, I mean, I was decent. I, I was good, but I was never going to make it at baseball. I'm yeah. five, five, 10, 160. Like well, I've got no chance. <laughs> glad, glad you brought that up. So I don't have to tell people how short you are. So anyway, um, right. <laughs> no problem. So, um, so you, you quit baseball, you're playing golf, you you start playing high school golf. You, um, you know, what was your process getting, uh, getting through high school, getting to play at the collegiate level? What, what did that process look like for you? Uh, so what happened was when I started playing high school golf, I, my, my ninth grade year, I averaged about uh, 54 on nine holes. And then by the time my senior year came around, I got it down to a 37 average. So, uh, that was pretty good. Um, I had never shot my first round under par until my last match of high school golf ever. So, I was a pretty late starter, to so, say the least. Yeah, late bloomer. But you, you get yeah. yourself into playing college golf. Now, where'd you play collegiately? So I started out at a teeny tiny little school in Lake Wales, Florida called Warner University. And that the only reason I went there was because they really had a startup team. And that was the only team I could even play for because, like I said, I had no resume. Uh, so I got there and we went to our first tournament and all of a sudden I shot 67, 70 and boom, I was like, okay, wow, I can do this. Yeah. You're so, off for the races. Yeah. So it was, went from there. I ended up keeping about a little over a 72 average my freshman year and, uh, ended up leaving Warner after a semester because after two year, or a year and a half, because, uh, the coach ended up getting let go or there was there was a series of situations they threatened to kind of like cancel the golf program didn't know what was then the golf program was in limbo so i moved back to west palm and played amateur events so this is kind of interesting because we've had numerous guests on the podcast where they've come from all different walks of uh, of life as far as you know their their golf upbringing so to speak whether it's coming from a a family of golfers where the you know where mother or father are head pro or coming from you know similar to you like just a baseball background where nothing much happened in th their amateur days I mean you had success in Palm Beach County winning winning events and and setting course records but you know you don't have the typical you know D1 college golf background but uh, but you turned professional now how what prompted the decision for you to, to turn professional and, and chase the dream of playing on the PGA Tour. So I, uh, I had, like you said, I, I, I won a local county event, um, which really isn't that big of a deal, but you know, it's the people around West Palm. It's, it's kind of a big deal around here. Uh, we got a lot of good golfers, but I, I won that tournament shooting a 62 in the final round, which is, which is great. And, and that to me is like, okay, wow. Okay. I, I don't need to show you. I can't, I don't have to just shoot 68, 69. I can go lower. And when I realized I could go lower, um, the year after that, I played in, I top, I finished in the top ten, and I believe it was in the top ten in all the county events I played in, uh, and I won Player of the Year without winning a tournament, which is kind of odd. But uh, uh, which so I felt like you know what, uh, I could get that, I could go to the next level, I could, I can get my game better, and um, I talked to my coach Martin Hall uh, about potentially turning pro, and he said I don't, I don't see what good being an amateur does you're not in college anymore might as well start playing against better competition so i made the jump i decided to turn pro and start on the minor league tour here in west palm sure and you know you mentioned martin hall i'm glad you brought that up so you know a lot of uh, a lot of aspiring young professionals whether or not they have status on tour or if they're toiling on uh, on many tours in the area you know they may work with a guy at the local club you know, they may work with some, uh, you know, someone they've known at the local driving range for years, but, but your coach is Martin Hall, who has, as many people know, who, who watch the golf channel, uh, you know, he does the, the golf channel Academy. Um, you know, he is a, a very well-known coach. I believe he's still out at Ibis in West Palm beach. Is that correct? He is. He's still out. And, uh, 
he juggles uh, the golf channel, Ibis, and everything else all at the same time. He, he works extremely hard. Like he's he's as good as it gets for a coach. Yeah, and and how how did you get with him? I mean, how was that choice made? And, and what do people that are listening to the podcast that only know what they see of him on TV? You know, what can you tell me about uh, Martin Hall as as a coach and as someone that you work with on a one on one basis? So Martin Hall is as advertised. He is as nice of a guy as it gets. So that accent he, is real, is what you're saying. That, like that's, that, that's, accent, that's, that accent is real. The gadgets are real. The gizmos are real. That whole that whole thing is real. And with Martin in that show, he puts 110 percent into that show, and he means and he cares everything about that about that whole show. It's it's he's as advertised. He's a great guy, and he, he loves his students. But so when I was in high school. My dad told me that if I can ever start breaking 80 consistently, we, we could get a pro. We could look into, you know, someone giving me some lessons. So uh, my dad taught me the basics, you know, as everybody else, keep your right arm tucked, left arm, like your left arm stiff, keep your head down, post up finish. And that's about all he could do for me. And then we went and saw Martin and uh, he was great. He, he took me, took me right there. thought that I had some, you know, potential and, and had some want to do this and, uh, Really, he just he just contact his assistant, and, and he'd love to have you. And uh, he's taken me. He took me from a about a eight nine handicap to a scratch within six months. Wow, that's uh, that's some pretty good work. Uh, is, yeah. is is Blair O'Neill at your lessons too, or is that that's not in that's not in- no that's that's not a, that's not in the picture. I asked him one time. I said, "Hey, Martin, how is it? What's it like working with the uh, girls that you work with?" He goes. He goes, why don't you be? Why don't you hit a five iron a little bit better next time? Next time. <laughs> so he just, just didn't want to get into that conversation. <laughs> no, he wanted nothing to do with that. Oh, <laughs> he on. goes, you can find out. He said, you can find out if you lead the world ranking and uh, lead the world in uh, proximity of the hole from two hundred yards. Oh, <laughs> okay. <great. laughs> All right. Wow. That's. Uh, I guess. I guess you have something to work for there. So uh, right. Yeah, so nice. So. Um, all right, so so you work with Martin Hall now. One of the interesting things too now, um, I I remember this distinctly. I, I forget exactly where I was, but I I you know uh, pick up a copy of uh, of Golf Digest or Golf Magazine or which which one or whatever it is, and you know after you read the the articles on the pros and you you leaf through the you know ninety seven pages of advertisements for uh, you know gadgets and golf vacations, they have their instruction areas, and I'm leafing through. I'm like, okay, that one's sir. You know, how to, how to, how to, you know, make more six footers and, you know, they got some guy hold the putter and then there's another one for, you know, how to, how to hit the cut. And then there's another one for, for tempo. And I'm like, shit, that looks like Mark, Michael Cartrude. And sure enough, it is. You're in golf digest as one of the, I guess, uh, swing models. Is that, is that kind of a, the phrase we should use for this? That, that's what it is a swing model that's that's exactly what You're, it is you are I you are eye candy for the golfing public uh, yeah i yeah it, how did that yeah. happen how the hell did that happen where we're where like all of a sudden like hey you want to be in golf digest yeah so he he yeah he says one day we're having a lesson he goes mike i got a question for you i said yeah he goes how would you like to be a swing model for uh for me in golf digest i said absolutely i'd love it that You're would like, be do i be get, awesome do i get to keep the clothes is that what you asked yeah me? well well that's what that's what happened and he goes he says to me he goes well you're gonna receive a phone call from uh marty hackle this afternoon i said well who's marty hackle Who? he goes he's the come on he's the guy. Yeah, i didn't know who he was so <sighs> he goes yeah he's, he's the golf digest uh you know, he kind of suits you up with the clothing, makes everybody look good, up to date, whatever. And uh, I talked to Marty that night. He's like, hey, we're going to send you an outfit or two for we got two photo shoots. We'll send you two outfits. A week later, I've got three boxes at my door. I've got Under Armour shoes. I've got Under Armour hats, belts, shirts. I got four shirt, six shirts. I got four pairs of pants Four. I'm like, this is fantastic. This is great. And uh, I was extremely happy with it, and uh, that was the first thing I asked when I got to the photo shoot. I said, "So do I have to give these back, or can I just uh, can I just keep these for myself?" Yeah, it's like, like well, we don't, yeah, no we rookie, don't want them back. yeah, no rookie. They're all yours. So, so it, it, describe for me the the. So you did this photo shoot. Was it at I? It was it at Ibis where you did the photo shoot? So we did one at Ibis. Uh, we did one at Ibis, and we did the other at the Medalist Par Three course. Nice in the back of the property which was really cool. I mean, cause the medalist gets a lot of press for all of its, uh, you know, pros and tiger and you know, Greg Norman and whatever else, but no one knows about the cool part three course in the back, which is, it's really a phenomenal place. 
So you do the photo shoot now. You did do it for Tempo now. How long is the process for that? And I mean, are they just asking you to do it again, do it again, or or stand here, do that? I mean, is it, you know, what's the process for doing those things? It's a couple hour process. They're taking photos. They're taking pictures. They're taking pictures of Martin. They're taking pictures of myself. They're they're wanting the ball to get in the right spot. They're wanting you to hit it the right way. They're wanting you to pose. And it's 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 kind of a it's kind of a weird process. I mean, you got to get the lighting right. I think they've taken 25 photos of you, 30 photos of you. I'm like, okay, we're good. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, we got to do them again. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool process the way they do it. And, uh, Martin's right there and he's kind of narrating the whole thing. And he actually did a live, a live, uh, feed one time for golfchannel.com, And it was impressive to watch. I mean, he only needed one take. He was good to go. I mean, it was, he's, he's a class act. He's really good at it, but that whole that whole episode that whole thing that he does there is it's phenomenal it's great so that had to have been an amazing experience you do that and then obviously this just gives you a little bit more i mean it's got to give you more confidence i mean i know it's it's just it's one issue of a magazine and it's a photo shoot but you know to have martin hall back you know some you know recommend you for this photo shoot it's got to give you confidence in moving forward because you know you're you're kind of a mini tour guy. You're not a big name, but you're in this magazine because of your your golf swing and your setup and your coach. So you you take that confidence and you're playing the mini tours. But how did you make the decision as to which tour and which route you wanted to take to help you get closer to the PGA Tour? The, the photo shoot and all that gives me it's a lot of comments. I've taken when the photos came out in the magazine. I took the magazines, I cut the photos out, and I actually I framed them, and I have some extra magazines because when I'm when is that may never happen again. It might happen more, you know. Sure. I don't know, but it was uh, it was cool, and, and I have them framed, and so it's definitely a confidence booster. It's uh, I I, I, I think it's cool. I, I like it, but so picking tours and how where to go. I was playing on the minor league tour for a couple for a few years, uh, just try, trying to play a lot of as many events as I can, and uh, still play them and whenever I'm, whenever I can. But, uh, I had a really rough month about five years ago. I got into a bad swing funk. I had a really, really rough month. And I said, well, I, uh, I got to figure something out here. I need to make some money somehow. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I decided to put an application in for some really cool courses around here to have kind of a winter job, you know, during the winter time when season's around. And I figure I'm going to put in for the five best golf courses I could think of around here. Medalists, MacArthur, Bears Club, Old Marsh, Jupiter Hills. And I got a call back from the head pro at the Bears Club and nailed the, I kind of nailed the interview and he took me on to the Bears Club. And while I was at the Bears Club, after three and a half, four years of working there, uh, you know, I had a few people, you know, that I put some time in practice and they noticed to it and they asked me if i had ever thought about canada and i said yeah i've thought about it i just can't go i don't you know right need a little i need some help and they offered some help and and, uh so that's where i'm at i'm up in canada well and we're gonna we're gonna talk about canada and some of your other um about your experiences playing uh you know pga tour the mckenzie tour up in canada and some of your other your exploits but you know you mentioned the bears club so i i can't let that go without kind of asking you about that i mean you're you know it's one thing to have just kind of a side uh job to help pay the bills and help save money for travel expenses and things like that but 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 man this this seems like a just an amazing experience where you not only get some financial help to to play that play the tour and and get some experience but i mean who the hell are you seeing i mean who aren't you seeing at the bears club and 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 you know just feeding off what they're doing i i can't imagine you have any short uh and any shortage of stories from the professionals you see at the bears club yeah well f- first off the bears club is uh, uh like you said it's it's an absolute class place uh with jack running it and stemming from the head pro all the way down uh, everyone there is just class people. The pro, the, the pros are, we have, we have somewhere around 30 pros there. Uh, and it's all the names you possibly could want. Um, and the membership's great, but seeing people at the bears club, I mean, we have members such as, you know, Rory McIlroy and Dustin Johnson, Ricky Fowler, Justin Thomas, and Grace, Alex Norin. I mean, McDonald, Ernie Els. It's, uh, 
Yeah, it's it, you see a lot of people, Michelle. We, I mean, a lot of people come through there. And it's, sure. it's really cool. And and when it's you're really there, cool. and when you're there um, working, and you just kind of get to see them, is the Bears Club a place where the pros prefer to be more, you know, off on their own doing their thing, and that maybe the normal or the the non you know touring professional members, you know, they kind of leave them alone, or are they they more fitting in with the membership there. I, you know what? I, I think it's a little bit of both. It depends on what they're doing. If they're there to play golf and hang out, they'll, they'll fit right in. They'll go in the locker room. They'll BS around, and, and it's great. And you know, but you can tell when it's time to work, they get to work. Uh, and it's uh, it's 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 good to watch. It's good to see. I mean, so uh, you know, sometimes during the Florida swing, we'll have other guys show up, and you know, um, you know, there's some guys like Alex Noren, who's just a class act. He's just a great guy. I mean. If someone's struggling on the range, he'll stop what he's doing and he'll come over and talk to you. And and there's guys like Rory when he's on the range, he's got three, four guys around him. Make, you know, it's his team. He's at work. He's in his office. You know, I mean, so the guys sure. handle it differently. But it's so good to watch each practice session and, and see how they handle it. And it's, it's unique. It's cool. What are what are some of the things that you know you're you're trying to get where they are? You know, you're you're there doing your job at the Bears Club, and you're there for for your purpose. They're there for their purpose, but you know, y- your eyes are open. I'm, I'm assuming your eyes are open, your ears are open. What are some of the things that you've noticed and you and you've seen? Okay, I need to incorporate that into my practice session, or I I need to I'm going to steal that drill. Yeah, watching watching Jason Day when he comes down during Florida swing, watching him practice is uh, is pretty spectacular. Like he's he's got you know his uh, his caddy out there with him, and they're scattering balls across kind of a teeing area, and the caddy's got the rangefinder right there, and he's hitting. Okay, the flag, red flag out on the left, short, short flag, or 78 yards. And Jason Day will, I mean, he'll sit there like it's the final round of the U.S. Open and he will hit that shot like he's trying to win. And then the next ball, it'll be like, all right, flag's back, you know, deep right on the, on the driving range, just 225. Jason Day will get out and he will go through his whole routine. And it's a very precise thing. And he'll do that for an hour, uh, just, just one ball at a time. And you can tell he's wore out by the time he's done because it's like playing real golf. And he get they get so precise. I mean, you watch these guys, you watch these guys hit. They're never just beating rocks in the middle of the range. I mean, they're always doing something with a purpose. And, right. Uh, yeah. So that so that's basically something that listeners of this podcast that work on their games they need to kind of take. You know, that's something to keep in mind. You know, here's Jason Day. You know, just hitting. He's not just hitting balls. He's basically rehearsing a round of golf in high-level professional pressure and trying to replicate it as best as possible. Absolutely, and and he's and that's the thing I think that you see. I watch our regular members, even our decent members, compared from them to the tour pros is the precision of practice, and I think that's what you see from from amateur, high-level amateur, mini tour pro, web pro professional pj tour is the level at which they practice it's it's uh i mean obviously just because you practice high level doesn't guarantee you to the pj tour but you know it certainly will improve your golf game dramatically you know yeah Any- precision, precision, precision is probably i mean i think getting more precise with your practice is 100 percent sure um Let's see. I want to talk, so I I, I don't want to get completely into just all of the the you know inner workings of the Bears Club. Got to respect the membership. Got to respect the privacy of them there. But I'm mm-hmm. sure there's got to be at least one funny story from your time working at the Bears Club that you can share about some of these guys. Yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's plenty. Uh, one that comes to the top of my head is Jason Day, and it was that same day I was watching him. He was. He was grinding in the back of the range. I mean, hours. He's back there hitting balls, hitting balls, hitting balls. Well, Dustin Johnson shows up, and Dustin gets out. He gets on the front of the range, and he's got his track man out. And Dustin hits about 15, 20, 25 shots on his track man, and Jason's right next to him, kind of really working hard. And, and uh, I remember I was watching Dustin, and he kind of gets on his phone a little bit and talks on the phone for about 15 minutes over by the range house, and then he kind of walks over to the – uh putting green rolls a few putts and that was it dustin left <laughs> that was his full prag it took about an hour at the most 45 minutes half of it was used on the phone jason day walks over me at the range house i'm kind of organizing each house there situation and jason goes hey uh 
like is is uh is that Dustin's routine? I mean, I've been here for like two weeks. I've seen him like three times, and that's usually what he does. And I say, like, "Yeah, that's about it." He's like, "Man, <laughs> wish I had that kind of talent. I gotta, I gotta work my butt off just to keep my, just keeping the where I'm at." And he's over here, twenty minutes on the phone, a few range balls here. Yeah, it's just amazing the talent that DJ's got. But <laughs> Jason was like, "Well, that sucks." <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I'm working my butt off here, and this guy's like doing whatever. Number one, number one player in the world. So yeah. So you're you're spending your time at Bears Club. You're you're learning from from the guys that are at the spot where you are are ultimately trying to get to. But um, but you know when you're when you get out of the Bears Club and you move on and you're well not move on but when you're out of the Bears Club and you're you're trying to compete on your own game and your own tournaments. Um, you know you mentioned you uh, you went to play Canada. So you're you're a Florida guy. Um, you know Canada is not exactly a direct flight uh, to just about anywhere. What was your first event on uh, on the McKenzie Tour? Like, how did you get started there? You know, whether it's, you know, Monday qualifying or, you know, how did you get going there? And what was the culture shock like, you know, getting this far away from home? Okay, so last year, this is my second summer playing the uh, McKenzie Tour, having status on the McKenzie Tour. And last year, uh, I was pretty pumped, I was excited. I got, uh, I got some status through qualifying and uh, – I was ready to go. I'm headed to Vancouver. Bought my about a month out. I bought my got my hotel, got my car, got my rental car, got my my tournaments picked out. I'm ready to go last last summer. So I'm excited. I'm ready to go to Vancouver. Never been to Canada or you know. I'm just I'm excited. So I get I get on the my we leave my apartment at four o'clock or three o'clock in the morning to get a five thirty uh flight out of Fort Lauderdale. It's early in the morning. I remember I've been prepared for this for a month. So I get all the way down to the airport. I scan my passport. It's not scanning. Scan it again. It's not scanning. It's 5.30. It's 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh, what's going on here? This is not right. So I look at the passport and I go, oh, no. Passport yeah, I grab my old. I grab my old passport instead of my new passport. Oh, rookie. So so step one, missed the flight. Okay, great. So they put me on an extra flight, an next flight out about six hours later. So this is going to be great. It's going to put me, it's going to land me in Vancouver at midnight. So great. So I get on the plane, land in Vancouver. All right, I'm here. All right, this is going to be fine. Go to the rental car places. They're closed. Great. Great. This is great. I'm stuck in an airport. Sure. I don't know where I am. I don't have money. I, 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 I don't have Canadian money yet. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Luckily, one guy saw me standing there just about just about ready to I, i'm about to sleep in the parking lot and <laughs> the guy goes here man i'll get you a car so needless to say he charged me an outrageous amount for a one night car okay. and uh so the next day i get the car i drive all the way to my hotel but i get there about like two in the morning finally go from the hotel the next morning back to the vancouver airport to drop off my drop off my rental car that i got well okay i didn't realize that the original rental car i got was from a hertz in the city of vancouver not at the airport there's my other mistake so oh, man i'm just rookie mistakes left and right so i get on a train get myself into the heart of the city of vancouver go to my spot where i get the rental car and they're like yeah we you didn't show up yesterday for your rental car because you missed your flight so we let your rental car go. So you're going to have to wait like four or five hours to get another one. So I'm sitting there for four or five hours waiting for my next car. So all this is going on. I'm getting frustrated. So they end up telling me after four hours sitting there like, well, we're not going to have a car for you today. Great. Great. So I've been I've wasted two days now. So finally get another taxi, get to a place that has a rental car. I get the rental car, try to get back to my hotel. If anybody knows Vancouver and rush hour traffic to leave the city of Vancouver, it takes about three hours to get out of that city. It's ridiculous. Traffic is nuts. Get back to my hotel room. Finally, it's night. I think I've got everything settled. I'm good. Next day, get to the golf course. It's called Swanee set. It's a Monday qualifier. First Monday qualifier for Canada. Now I get there, I find out a cool fact about the golf course that Swanee said, by the way, it's, they filmed a good portion of happy Gilmore. there. pretty sweet. The whole go to your home scene was filmed there. Oh, nice. Pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. So play a nice little practice round. Golf course is kind of funky. It's a little odd. Greens are a little odd. I get to the wake up the next day, seven forty-five tea time, go out, shoot 68, tie for first in the Monday qualifier. I'm in Canada that week. That's 
<laughs> that's that's ridiculous that you went through yeah, all that I, nonsense. I'm all, I'm all over the place, forgetting passports, missing flights, can't get a rental car, driving to get out of the city, just stress stressful. Can't never been. To, but if we just I, get you on the golf course, you're fine. Yeah, just put me there. I'm in my. I'm fine. But okay. doing everything else, I've gotten much better at it. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. we'll see. So, over. <laughs> so, so you get there, you Monday qualify now. A lot of people may not know the dynamic of the Canadian tour. You know, a lot of great players have graduated from that tour, made it to the big tour, whether we're talking about, you know, Mackenzie Hughes or Tony Finau, you know, they, they've made it their way. But what's the, what's the culture? What's the dynamic of, of that tour? The dynamic of that tour is getting to the tournament, and it's basically a race to – I mean, it's an absolute race to how low can you go? I mean, your this year's scores on the tour, you've had to shoot, you've had 25 under multiple times. You've had 25 under through three rounds of golf at one event. You've had six under par cuts. It's these guys are good, man. I mean, the Canadian tour is really, really good. Uh, anybody who doesn't know this year, just in the graduating class this year. I mean, I don't know all the names left and right, but Chase got Chase Wrights, you know, graduated from Webb this year and. Uh, Kramer Hickok graduating for web this year. Uh, we've had, there's plenty of guys that are on the web and PGA coming right out of Canada, right out of Canada. And it's a strong tour. It's a really strong tour now. Now is it, and and those are amazing scores. And I know that, that there are players that shoot those scores, you know, uh, you know, all over the country, whether it's on, you know, web or, or, you know, a McKenzie tour, or Latin America tour, even the PGA tour. But is it, and I'm, I'm just asking not to, not to, you know, uh, you know, degrade any of the talent that's out there, but is it because of, you know, course, course setup or pin positions, or is it just that these guys just are that good? I mean, how, you know, what are the lengths of some of these courses and what are kind of some of the setups? Uh, I, I mean, is it just, just bomb driver and just knocking wedge wedges close or are these, you know, what are kind of the setups that you're dealing with? Well, setup wise, most of the I would say most of the golf courses are between about 68 to 7100 yards. A lot of the golf courses are uh, you're I mean obviously you're not you're not playing you're not playing um you know TPC Sawgrass. You're not you're not playing those kind of golf courses. Uh so a lot of them you can get and if the winds die down or it's where it has rained in, in the last couple of days it softens up the greens and uh you know, if you get any kind of soft conditions out there, these guys are these guys are going to tear it up. So, yeah. um, I, you know, I've talked to, I've played practice rounds with some guys, and they say that you know the pin should be, you know, three from the edge, four off the front, versus seven from the edge, eight off the front. They think that you know if you tuck the pins a little more, that scores will be scores will be higher. I'm not quite sure if that's the situation because it seems like these guys go low no matter what. Um, so uh, there are these are they're, they're great golf courses. I think they're in great shape. The Canadian Tour does a great job of getting nice venues um, and travel all over the country. I mean, you travel from Vancouver to Nova Scotia to Montreal, Toronto, and you're going all over the place. What's your What's your favorite stop so far? What's your favorite city in Canada? Oh, man, Vancouver is incredible. Victoria is incredible. Uh, Nova Scotia was a lot of fun. They canceled that event this year due to, uh, the host hotel burnt down and a lot of unfortunate situations. Yeah, that could could be a problem. Yeah, it does, does affect things. But I mean, when you go out, when you go out to Calgary, uh, you go out to Calgary, you take a rental car and drive to Banff and the mountains and Banff and Jasper and, uh, Banff National Park are absolutely incredible. So those are the you get bc and alberta are probably the two best spots nice yeah i've seen uh i've seen on your instagram and your social media platform some of the pictures you've posted i'm gonna uh take those and let, let people uh some of our listeners see some of those pictures and and yeah i've, I've it, those look like amazing courses out there um wow so give me an example i mean you already gave me your example of your first uh, experience getting into a monday qualifier after just a planes trains and automobiles uh like uh adventure to get out there but uh you you recently had a monday qualifier in toronto and that didn't go great but you just embarked on a huge uh, huge trip east so tell me about that week so in the last two years i've i've mondayed into seven seven canadian events uh just kind of nuts but um 
you know, when you're doing Monday qualifiers, you, you've got to kind of sometimes, sometimes you need a backup plan. Sometimes you need to have situations. So I hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. Let me cut you off. So, um, before you tell me about Toronto, you just mentioned something about, you know, qualifying for, you said seven, you, you successfully got into seven Monday qualifiers, right? Yes, uh, Monday into seven in the last two years. Yeah, okay. six last year, one this year. Okay, so I, I just want to have listeners get an idea. We always like to to get a behind the scenes uh, idea on the mentality of of touring professionals. How do you mentally approach Monday qualifiers? Number one, you absolutely, you absolutely have to play well. There is no other way around that. There, if you, if you're if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying not to shoot high, you're done. If you're trying not to make a double, you're done. Uh, you've you've got to mentally go in there one shot at a time, ball in the fairway, ball in the green, make your putt, and, and really try to get your way around the golf course. And if you make a mistake, get ready to recover. Like you cannot let it go. Uh, you know you have to shoot. You have to shoot something in the sixties. Have to. I mean. Every once in a while, you can get away with something shooting maybe high sixties, but for the most part, you you got to shoot in the mid sixties, um, and that's uh, it's about showing up and just making it happen. Uh, if you look at Monday qualifiers, uh, you know guys all over the country are shooting sixty seven or better to get into these months to qualify for tournaments, and they're doing it under the gun. So it's a it's a mental grind, and it's uh, it's tough because if you miss the Monday, you don't know what you're doing, you know, and, and you don't know where you, when you're going to get your next paycheck. So it's difficult, but it's, uh, at the same time, it's a lot of fun. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's, it's crazy, but I love it. So you, you get through these Mondays, you go to Toronto. Um, tell me about this Toronto, uh, this Toronto <laughs> adventure. So on. crazy situation in Toronto this year. I, uh, I flew to Toronto, um, Got in, got in kind of late. Uh, didn't get to play a practice round at the golf course um, just because I was playing in the uh, the Florida Open. I had just finished up the Florida Open in Innisbrook this year, um, so flew in late to Toronto. Planned on showing up Monday morning for my tea time, and or Monday afternoon for my tea time, and and just going from there and just trying to you know pick the golf course apart from what I see. Well, the whole front first wave of Monday qualifiers went out. Uh, low scores or low scores were posted and I, uh, was ready to go. And then all of a sudden this rain came in and we had to show up the next morning. I said, you know what? Hey, that's a good break. You know, I don't have to play on greens where 80 people have already gone out and played. I'll get fresh greens tomorrow morning. I'll be ready to go. So next morning winds are blowing 15 to 20. So clearly not the same conditions. One, one morning they had no wind. the next morning I had wind. So really you got two different tournaments and, uh, that's, that's another situation of what can happen with Monday qualifiers. You get the bad end of the draw or any tournament. Sure. Um, but so we're playing this Monday qualifier. I end up shooting 70. That's not good enough. Needed 68. I think with the wind needed 68 was the playoff. Like, uh, it was probably a nine way playoff or two spots or something. And then, um, I said, okay, well, what am I doing next? I, I called up, the Bangor Open in Maine. I mean, why uh, wouldn't you? I, yeah, I mean, there's something to do, something to play in. You got to find something to play in. So I'm looking for flights to Bangor, and I can't find flights. Finally, find one. It's like seven hundred dollars. Yeah, oh, that's not that's not happening. So I go get the airport. I go to the airport, get a rental car, and I drive from Bangor or I drive from Toronto to Bangor, Maine. Now, I'm thinking I'm going to have a nice little cruise. So. I'm driving. I'm in the middle of my 12 hour drive. I'm like, it's four o'clock. I'll call Bangor. I just want to see what my pro MT time is tomorrow. You know, whatever. My pro MT time is at 7 a.m. I've got 10 more hours to drive. It's already four o'clock in the afternoon. Fantastic. So get all the way across the border. I get all the way to the border in Quebec to Maine. And the lady pulls, the lady at the border patrol pulls me out and says, uh, So what are you doing? <laughs> I go, I'm going to, going to it's, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm going to Bangor. She's like, why are you going to Bangor? I said, I'm actually going to play golf. She's like, so you're crossing the border at 1 a.m. to go play golf. I said, yeah, I got 7.30 tea time. <laughs> She's like, 
you're joking. I said, no, 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 I'm serious. She goes, I don't believe you. So I guess she says, I need you out of the car. I'm going to check your trunk. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm getting security check because I'm going to play golf. Nice. She opens she opens my golf bag. She looks at my golf bag. She goes, you're really going to play golf? I said, yeah, I've driven 10 hours to get here. I still got two more to go. And so I finally get to my Ramado hotel at two in the morning. I get four hours of sleep or three in the morning. I get four hours of sleep. I get right to the T, 7.15 in the morning, go out, win the Pro-Am, and the Bangor, a Bangor Open Pro-Am, of course. show up for the tournament. And shoot, uh, ended up shooting 67, 63, 64, and won the tournament. <laughs> so, Crazy that, yeah, that whole situation was kind of. I mean, I, I hate to break this to you, but I don't think, I, I think it's better if you just kind of stay on, on PGA Tour Canada with all these travel. I mean, if you start doing the private jet route, you'll be completely out of your element. I mean, I don't think that's going to work for you. No, I think I ought to just do crazy deadlines and just try to just just barely make tea times, and maybe I'll do all right. Yeah, I think you need to call up TJ Vogel and uh, uh, talk to him and uh, work it out with him because that guy seems to be the master of uh, Mondays on the PGA Tour. So yeah, I was gonna say talk about a guy you want to talk to Monday. Talk about Mondays. Too. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's yeah. He's in a, he's in a rare category, but no. I got to play with him. I got to play with him last year in Nova Scotia. Heck of a player. It's no surprise on why he's uh, why he Monday qualified in eight tournaments this year. I mean, he's he's a good, really good, solid player, yeah. solid, solid golfer. There's another there's another success story coming off the Canadian tour. I know, I know. This is another one. So, well, Michael, you've been giving us great stories this entire episode. Most of them at your expense. Um, I kind of feel bad about that. Or do you have any stories? I got a real funny one for you. Okay, so tell me how. Let's to... talk about the day I met you. Oh no. Uh, yeah. Okay. Jupiter. Jupiter Hills. All right, hold on. Let me let me hole. hold on. Let me tee it up a little bit. Let me tee up the story a little Go bit. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. All right. So this is uh, so we've been through we we've been through your your professional career, your upbringing in golf, but uh, it it occurs to me that uh, I'm going to give you the upper hand here in this part of the podcast episode. It is your episode after all, and you apparently would like to tell a story of how you met me. So I'm sure yeah, this is going would, to be embarrassing, but you go I ahead. I would love for people to hear this. So here we go. Oh, so fantastic. I'm showing up. I, I qualify for my first tournament, first ever tournament I qualified for. And it's the state amateur at Jupiter Hills. And I get in basically on the number and I get, I get paired up with this guy, Ben Adelberg. Never, never heard of him. Never. I don't know any of these guys, the local guys, whatever. Well, it's all well, changed now. Everyone knows me now, Michael. Yeah, everybody knows you. Well, here I am thinking I'm some I'm some hotshot kid who had no business. I show up with a tailor made R seven tour bag to my state am third <laughs> third round with a uh, with a Puma belt buckle that was probably the size of, as you described it, a license plate. And uh, I'm this guy this guy walks up on the tee says hi i'm ben i'm like hi i'm I'm mike nice to meet you whatever and we're on the tee and he's getting ready to announce our names and he goes you you, you say hey bro what are you doing with a tour bag and a belt buckle the size of a license plate man who dressed you (laughs) meanwhile the guy i'm looking at in bright pink shorts bright pink shirt white belt and pink colored irons on the back of his bag and i'm like who the heck is this cat that sounds like me that does yeah, sound like what, me. I what mean, are we? What, who am I talking to here? What am I dealing with? I mean, I mean, pink Mizuno. I mean, Mizuno Tezoid Pro irons. Yes, with the pink with pink paint little fill. nail polish. Pink, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, that was a nail polish. I had those sent out custom. Pink, <laughs> pink paint fill. You can't find that anywhere. Um, yeah, that was the 2008 state amateur in uh, in in Jupiter Hills. Yes. Um, Needless to say, 18 holes later, we're friends, and 10 years later, we're doing a podcast. Exactly. So it's worked out well for you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so no, that uh, definitely was uh, boy. That golf course ate our lunch, didn't it? Yeah, no doubt. That's uh, that's an incredible track. Yeah, incredible. and that's and yeah. that's why I am 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 hosting a podcast. And you are barely able to cross the border in Canada to uh, to get into uh, PGA Tour, McKenzie Tour events. So what a kickoff around with Ben Ben Albert. There you go. <laughs> so before we get you out of here, because I'm sure you have more embarrassing stories about me to share, we're going to cut that off really quick. But uh, before we get you out, we do have a a quick segment always here at the podcast called. 
the quick bucket at the back of the range. So these are standard questions we always like to ask, get a little bit of different take. So first one is Jack Nicholas. Now remember, you're a Bears Club guy. So Jack Nicholas won the Masters in 1986 at the age of 46. Compare that to a potential fifth green jacket of Tiger Woods. Which would be the more substantial victory, do you think? With, oh gosh, man, you put me on the spot. I would say it's a. I would say it's a cooler story. I would say it's a better story. It Tiger. might be one of the. If Tiger won another green jacket, it might be one of the greatest American sports stories of all time. Yeah. Just the rise, the fall, the comeback, the whole thing would be incredible. Yeah. I'm, I mean, but I'm a huge Tiger fan. I grew up watching Tiger. Yeah. So. Uh, let's see another one for you. If you could give a major championship to anyone in history whether they're alive or dead, they have no majors, they have 18 majors, who would you give a major championship to? And unfortunately, can't give it to uh, can't give it to yourself. We've had to make that rule. Oh, man, if I could give it to one person. Alex Martin. Okay. First person to throw that name out there. Any particular reason? Yeah, well, it, I mean, getting to work at the Bears Club, I've gotten to know him a little bit. That guy is the best, the nicest, one of the nicest, the coolest. He's he's awesome, awesome. He's just a great guy, and I think if you've gotten to know him, I mean, I one day we're on the. He's been up and down on tour, and I and two years ago, yeah, I think he won four times in the European tour, and he finally broke into the top fifty world rankings. And he actually got in the top ten, and come January first, he came up to me on the range. He goes, "Hey, Mike." I qualified for the Masters. I qualified for the Masters. I'm so pumped. Like, he was so pumped. He was like a little kid in a candy store. That's awesome. Gets to go to his first Masters. And, I mean, you see the guy. You don't really get to see the background of these guys. And to see him so pumped to go play in his first Masters. And when he won four times that year. And he works his butt off. And so, just to see how hard he works. And coming back from wrist surgeries. And to being the top 20 player in the world consistently is, is pretty impressive. I would give one, I would give it to him. Nice. What, uh, before I let you go, I totally forgot to ask you this question. These guys get equipment thrown at them from all of their, uh, you know, equipment sponsors and anyone that's got a new fangled wedge or putter or driver, or Hey, check this out or whatever. What's, uh, what's been one of the most like just eye opening jaw dropping, it, it, you know things you've seen out there with these guys with all their gear i mean do they just have just you know dozens of wedges and putters and just stuff all over the place they they do so lou donald had me grind down one of his wedges he comes up to me i mean i i do a lot of the clubber i've done no, no, i mean i've done some of the clubber pair over at bears club i've gotten pretty good at it and so luke donald heard i was the guy so he comes over to me and goes hey can you grind a wedge I, uh uh, yeah, it's like the best, this is like the best bunker player of the last like right. 20 I, I years. Gotta grind, I got to grind this guy's custom wedge from Mizuno that he pulled out of the box. I'm like, okay, great. You know, so I get this grinder out and he's standing right next to me. So I start grinding his wedge and I put it in there, I grind a little bit. And he goes, I, you, you, I, he's like, I asked you to grind it. I'm like, you want me to go at this thing? And he's like, yeah, grind it. So I put it in there and I start grinding it down. He goes, Hey man. I've got 600 of these back at the house. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll grind it. <laughs> Shoved it in there and just start grinding the crap out of it. You're, you're protecting this one single Mizuno wedge. Like he just went over to the PGA Superstore with his American Express card and bought it with his like rewards points. Yeah. Meanwhile, exactly. he's got a, he's got a pallet of them in his garage. Right. And as soon as he said that, I got like 600 of them. I'm like, all right, now now we'll, we'll go at it. You can get another one. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's. I guess that's another another reason why they're on a different planet than us. But you're you're going to get to that planet uh, as soon as we get you. We need to get you a traveling secretary, though. Uh, that is <laughs> gonna, pretty good at it. We are going to get. We're going to find you someone to to get you around. So. Um, well, Michael, listen, I really appreciate the time that you that you gave us tonight uh, to, to, to join us here at the back of the range. We will definitely get uh, get uh, get some back of the range mojo going for you. Uh, it seems to be helping everyone that comes on the podcast, whether they qualify for events or win events. Uh, see if we can get, uh, get some of that going your way. And uh, best of luck. Send, to it, send, it the, send it the second week of October for q -Sport. We can do that. We will definitely yeah. do that, and uh, yeah. and we'll definitely keep track of what you're doing, and uh, we'll revisit with you next year uh, when you're on uh, when you're on the web. Cool. Looking forward to it. 
And there you have it. Another great episode here at the Back of the Range. Thank you so much to Michael Cartrude for joining us this week. Keep submitting reviews in Apple Podcasts. Let me know what you think of the podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget, next week, we'll be back with another episode here at the Back of the Range.